Elementary. This is my third year there, and also want to give a shout out to my coworkers and my team because we would not have as much success without everyone being a part of this. So first of all, second grade, um, you have to think about your audience, who you're going to be working with. I work with seven and eight year olds who are not as independent with technology as maybe middle schoolers and high schoolers. Um, they had experience in Google Classroom previously in my room, but getting them independently, their long emails, I'm getting them type that in. We knew that was going to kind of be a point of frustration for them. Also, who are they living with? Who's going to be helping them? They live with grandparents. They live with great grandparents and even family members who might not have had as much exposure to technology as well. So we streamlined our second grade work all into one place. I also, I haven't shared this other times, but keeping everything in one place for a seven-year-old was really important too, because that, if they only have to go to one place and click and it takes them directly where they're supposed to go, that's very helpful with not giving them that extra distraction of going to watch music videos on YouTube or wherever they might actually want to go rather than doing their schoolwork. So in their slide, which I'll show you in a minute, this is their first page that they get. This is something all of our staff is using. Um, it's similar to a choice board. So if you have a kid who loves reading, decides, I want to do all my reading the first day, they have that option where they could go um, in a horizontal direction if they want to do all their reading or all their science. Now, in the vertical direction is set up to be structured like their school day. So we wanted to think about how we can you're freezing up a little bit, but that's okay. Keep going. It's, it should be fine. Um, we go through their slides. Um, you'll see all the things that say click here. We'll take them to a direct slide where they type in their answers and they, they do their work. So those would be set up in, in their normal school day setting. Need that structure and crave that structure as well. We've got their reminders. I keep all their passwords on here. Um, you'll see down next is that learning at home, which hyperlinks to all of these things. So it starts on Monday. Um, and they have different activities for each day. So let's kind of look through that for a second. I'm a visual learner, so I wanted you to kind of see how it's set up. And this will also stay on the document. So you're welcome to use this as a resource. All right, going back to the original slide, every single day in my classroom, um, I have a question of the day. When they come in, they hang up their backpack, I have a question on the board, and it's really just a way that I get to know my students better or kind of find out things that might be going on at home that I wouldn't know had I just be like, okay, good morning, let's get to work. So it's important for me to make that a part of NTI. So there's little emojis on the side, and the students can drag and drop their emoji that and they're they're seven so they think that's cool that they feel like they're texting and they can type to me why they feel that way so I've had students um tell me you know that they're sad that they, or that they don't want to do their work right now they'd rather be outside or they'll tell me really exciting things like hey like I got a new scooter today and um it's been a great way for me to connect and those students who have experienced frustration you know I can kind of type back a message like hey you're doing a great job I had a student last night and he was like I like this page it's the only page I know I've gotten right and I was able to write back to him like you've done great like your math looks amazing so hopefully it was an encouragement to him it's just kind of one of those things where they can put out their frustration. Um, on the next slide, I put in some images of our slides. And for their reading, we just have them answer a simple question so we know that they've read it. All of their writing, we put on their sentence stems because that might be a support that most of them have in the classroom. So I, I know one of our things this week was like, you know, you need to start, you need to have three sections in the in the beginning, in the middle, in the end, and we'll write on there. We need to see more than one sentence so that our expectations are clear. Um, and with this being in Google Slides, I've been able to go in and highlight like, hey, you need, you need to go back and fix this or can you add punctuation? Lastly, in the corner, you'll see we've added in visual cues um, just because they are 
they are young and sometimes things might not work. Um, this was a link I was having trouble with. It worked for some people, didn't work for others. So I went in using the snipping tool and showed them if you can't get this to work, this is exactly what you need to do to get to this website. Um, and my students, because they have enough visuals, it's all in one place and they're kind of in the swing of things now, they're independently logging in and doing this on their own out of my 15 kids 14 are doing this on Google Classroom and I've had high participation rates and they're really enjoying doing this work and I could not be more proud of them. That's great. Yes, that's all I've got, Joe. Oh, uh, Sarah, first of all, I, I had a couple comments if you don't mind. One, you have one of the best backdrops I've seen of any presenter. That's awesome. Uh, what sort of positive feedback have you gotten from your students and parents about this new way they're doing school with you? Yeah, so a lot of my a lot of my students who I was very worried about that are a little bit more squirmy or have more behavioral episodes in the classroom have amazed me because they're the ones that are having the most success with this. It's totally blown my mind. And it's really changed my mindset of maybe this is something I need to implement more in the classroom when I get back. Because in my head, if I let a kid choose who maybe struggles with behavior, it's just innate I think in our bodies that if you're letting them go and choose what they want to do and they're having fun or whatever that's like a reward for that behavior but I'm really seeing that when they get to choose and then maybe they need to take a few minutes of a break that that's something that they actually need and that helps them be successful more so than just rewarding you know a behavioral episode so I've, I've been really impressed by that and just they've become more motivated internally with being able to choose their own structure. So that choice board, I really um, like the idea of taking that back into the classroom and maybe letting them choose their own science, what order they want to do their science or their writing in the week. Because at the end of the day, as long as, as long as it's getting done and they're doing their best and having fun with it, I don't, I don't care how it, what day it gets done. I just want them, you know, learning. Yeah. So it's been really great to see that. And the parents have had positive comments on how they really appreciate appreciate that we put everything into one document and maybe there are other students from different schools or different grade levels haven't had that experience. So just everything being in one place, they've said it. Been super I think that is great that you uh, did that. That has been, you know, we hear some of the concerns and that is one is like, it's, there's too many different places to go. And those teachers and teams that have found ways to keep it in one place, very beneficial. So, and I agree on the choice, given students choice, hopefully that's a great thing that every teacher is going to take away from this. And uh, when we return, it, it'll it'll be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so why don't we move along? Because we do have four other Great. people to sure. speak for our little 30 minutes. And we are going to talk about all of these speakers, kind of highlight a lot of those components that you're talking about around student voice and choice and how they're communicating with parents. So Daniel Krogan, he was a middle school math teacher at the Marion Seymour School um, has been sharing with us, but she's not able to get on today. So I believe Maddie Shepard is going to step in and talk about Danielle's work. Yep, Danielle's uh, had some technical difficulties today, but uh, no worries, we will press on. Uh, so Danielle teaches uh, middle school math um, and oh. her team has a very... Uh, Maddie, I was able to get on. Yay! <laughs> I just got it to work from... I know, I just got it to work from Derek's phone, so sorry for my um, delay. Glad you're here. No worries, glad you're here. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, technical difficulties, but I don't know where you started, but I'll just pick up with my part. Um, so our main focus at Moore in seventh grade math um, and my team in general was helping teachers, um, parents, students all stay organized. Um, while also keeping students engaged with voice and choice um, throughout um, our NTI time. So the first thing um, that we talked about, it was having a, a team set of teachers um, was keeping everybody on the same page um, and making sure we were and one class. So I created this Google Sheets um, with checkboxes that has a list of all of our student names. So that way we can um, check in with students that are completing work or not completing work. Um, for example, student number one, you can see um, didn't check in during week one or week two of NTI. Um, so we 
reached out specifically to them over and over until they were able to um, at least eventually during week three start getting at least one assignment turned in. We also indicated on um, student 11, those students that were receiving paper packets to um, make sure that one of us could check in with them on a regular weekly basis to see if they needed help with anything from the JCPS choice boards. And really this helped us keep up with our students um, to make sure they were being marked present, even if they weren't specific, specifically completing our work, they were still at least checking in and trying to do something. And then um, our next part was to make sure that parents were staying on the same page. So I created this Google Slides um, that has all four of our subject and content areas on one, sh one slide that parents can see. Um, and they're all hyperlinked and it was really helpful for parents um, to see every subject in one screen so that way they didn't have to check back and forth through our Google Classrooms to try to find individual assignments. And then if they wanted more specifics, those are all hyperlinked from each subject area too. And then finally on organization, we posted on our Google Classroom a student checklist. Um, to keep up with all of their um, materials that they needed to get turned in. I mean, we broke it down by subject area so they can just put a check mark in there whenever they complete did something. And this wasn't anything that we graded, just simply for students to stay organized. And for our math department to keep students engaged, we decided to use our own variation of the student choice board. And um, giving students a lot of options and how they wanted to learn and move on with our materials. So option one, um, students had the Khan Academy um, option where they could watch instructional videos and do the practice there. Khan Academy is a great resource. Um, and then also as our seventh grade math PLC, we created instructional videos from our team and students were able to use the different methods that we talked about in class. For option two, students could watch those teacher videos and um, then complete some IXL topic areas connected. Um, and then option number three, students could watch those same video um, from the teachers. And then they had the option of doing um, kind of like a story or game mode type review um, to get them through as well. Um, with the story mode reviews, I also um, created some interactive websites for students. So during weeks one and two, students um, reviewed all of the IM units one through six that we covered prior to going on um, our coronation, as I call it, um, at school but they were, I don't know if we have time. Oh yeah, you, I'm sorry, I'm trying to mute myself because I can hear my dogs barking. I bet. <laughs> Technical difficulties today. Um, these are interactive websites and students were given um, worksheets to follow along. And I know Maddie really likes the Harry Potter one. So I'm sure she's gonna click on that one. Um, so I created these interactive websites in each um, tab or page that student visit is a review of each unit that we covered prior to it. So the first one that she clicked on here is um, Green Gods Bank. And something that we cover in seventh grade is changing um, from positive and negative numbers using a number line. So if you know anything about Harry Potter, you know that the vaults go really far down into the ground and then they also have a bank above ground level. So um, using that change in elevation to represent positive and negative numbers were one of the things that I pointed out specifically. And then the second huge thing in seventh grade math is um, applying percentages to real world context. So I created um, a shopping list where students have to go shopping at Diagon Alley um, and buy different materials and things they need for the upcoming school year and then they have a coupon page where they have to um, apply percentages um, for discounts and coupons and also apply taxes um, for the different stores and um, like I said 
applying percentages is something huge in seventh grade that they learn how to do, especially applying to real world context as well. Um, and my fantasy world context too, I guess. That is amazing. Uh, I bet your kids love that. I, my, my kids would like to do that right now. Very cool. Yeah, they really, really enjoyed it, especially the Fortnite one. I can't tell you <laughs> how many of my 103, 23 students did the Fortnite review because that's what all middle schoolers love right now. Yes, yes, they do. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Danielle. I'm glad that worked out for you to get on and share oh. your work with us. I love hearing how you are engaging your students with things that interest them and giving them choice. Um, next, we're going to move to a ELA, an ELA example from Frederick Olmsted Academy South. Um, I believe Sarah Bryant is on the line. Yes, thank you. So at OAS, we decided to make the choice boards provided by JCPS our primary focus of NCI. So regardless of whether a student is in 6th, 7th, or 8th grade, and regardless of their access to technology, the requirement is the same for all students. They're expected to read for 20 minutes a day and complete four choice board activities a week in addition to their related arts work. We're using this system to simplify communication and to make sure that all students are receiving high-level quality instruction. Um, in addition to this overall requirement, we've created an OAS extension site which allows students to engage in learning on their own terms. Teachers have created special Google Classrooms um, to host what are essentially like after school clubs. Um, students can freely choose topics um, that interest them, um, regardless of what grade level they're in and what teacher is hosting the club. Um, this allows us to build relationships across all grade levels and um, it increases student engagement because they're choosing the activity they want and they're even allowed to um, tell a teacher that they think we should host a club just like at normal school. So, um, so how does the choice board requirement work? We can go on to the next slide. Each week, grade levels divide the activities on the weekly choice board by core content area. And then PLCs work together mm -hmm. to create scaffolding materials, models, and lessons for each um, activity that they're sponsoring. So for example, on choice board number two, one of the activities that ELA sponsored in eighth grade was an activity called poem or song lyrics analysis. So my PLC, since we were sponsoring this activity, we um, each had a spot for this activity to be turned in in our Google Classroom. And then attached to that, we had the rubric, um, a think aloud model, um, and then scaffolding materials to support them. But yeah, we broke it down step by step. And this is a model that I created and there's a video attached in the first slide there that shows like how to actually go through and do it. Um, let's see, so the single point rubric that we use that was really beneficial. That was Miss Erin Yates idea. Um, and that helped us to provide stronger effective feedback because it gave us the ability to hone in on our essential standards and what we were looking for in particular. Um, so even when the activities were focused on music or health, which my PLC and I have no formal training on, um, we're able to establish clear expectations that still align to our content area standards. So the dis interdisciplinary choice boards um, give students the opportunity to see how their skill sets in other classes apply across all content areas. There are many benefits many benefits to the system, but overall, um, I think the three best are that it allows teachers to experience that interdisciplinary um, uh, model, like working with different activities. And we might not have had the opportunity or like we might have been more hesitant to do that if we weren't given this, um, this experience. So also we have been able to become experts on just a few activities each week, um, which I think improves our instruction but there's still an ample amount of student choice because they have nearly a dozen activities to choose from each week, but the teachers are you know, really focused on just a few, which allows us to be more effective in our feedback and allows us to produce stronger um, scaffolding and models. Um, we're also able to be just as engaged in the work that students are doing at home without technology, because it's the same work that students are doing digitally. So when we talk on the phone or when they call a friend to work on an assignment together, the expectations are achievable and clearly set across the board. 
Um, as far as implications for future left lesson design, we've touched on several of these points, but um, I did just want to mention a few student self pacing. The feedback we're getting from students is that being able to work at their own speed and check in when they really need help is really working for them. Um, now, as a teacher who regularly utilizes the workshop model, I'm trying to figure out what works in the NTI setting that doesn't work in the classroom. And I think the difference is just being surrounded by your peers, which <laughs> I can completely understand, but I'm not sure yet how we counter that uh, in the classroom. I think it's probably going to involve having like Google Meet office hours after school where they can kind of catch up if they got off task in the classroom. Standards based grading is the way to go. Technology 101, we need to be really intentional with making sure that all of our students know how to use the technology and the resources that are available within it. Um, opportunities for self-expression, build engagement. And finally, the relationships are everything. Um, even more than just students will work for you when you when they know you care, we also need to help them build a positive relationship with their learning and help them find their own why. Great, thank you, Dan, um, Sarah, for all of that. So we've seen a couple of uh, themes running through the three teachers we've heard from so far, very interdisciplinary, um, student-centered, and grounded in engagement with kids, what was going to really resonate with them. And now we're going to shift to um, high school, which is sometimes seen as a bit more challenging. And we're going to hear from science teacher Caleb Johnson from Central High School. Hi, thanks for having me on. Yeah, uh, more challenging. It, it, it's tough to get people uh, to agree on things, I feel like, in high school a lot of times, because we get so siloed and, and so kind of set in our, our ways, like chemistry has to look this way, biology has to look this way. Um, so the first thing we actually had to figure out at Central was, what are we going to do with NTI? Um, you know, um, there's this whole idea, so if we go to the next slide, uh, that we have to teach all our standards, that we have to spend hours studying all the minutiae of science, all these little details, and that kind of you know, we have to let go a little bit um, so that we can really make sure that we're meeting the needs of our students. And so we settle on just continue learning is what we kept hearing. And so what does that look like? Well, we came up with these interdisciplinary choice boards that we uh, have heard so much about. Um, and I, I got to say, not a lot. People were a little hesitant at first, um, myself included. But the more I dug into it, the more I found that when I took my standard out of the center of this board, and, and really put in a compelling question, something that was going to make my students scratch their head and think. Um, I, I found that it became a lot easier to make this. I, can't, I found that it provided a lot of structure for what my students wanted to do. And um, we'll talk about this a little later, but once again, the student interest was just you know un, unbeatable. So if we go to the next slide, you can take a look at what this uh, compelling question kind of looks like. Um, one of my standard boards that we would have talked about in chemistry would have been material science and how the structure and, um, and, and, you know, organization of the molecular level affects the properties of these things, of these compounds. Like, and so we focus on polymers and plastics. I know a lot of people are focusing on metals, uh, if you have metal program in your school. Um, but the idea that I chose to focus on instead was why is Earth's waste management in crisis? That's a tough question to answer for anybody. Um, and it might even, you know, ignite some some future budding scientists in my students. It, it might ignite something in them because this is a question that's relevant. It's real world. Um, and so you can see just some features of this. I've got across the top. That, those are our high quality core instruction kind of big rocks. Um, these are things that we say all students should be able to demonstrate by the time they graduate. So I came up with a compelling question. And then I thought about the product. How can I get my students to be advocates, to be empathic citizens, thoughtful researchers, global leaders, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's where you see those little uh, notifications, those little icons around my choice board as well. Um, I did require one um, assignment. Uh, and, and I have suggested my students, if you want to get an A+, plus, then you need to do uh, three of these just to give breadth. You know, they're, they're designed to be shorter, more manageable, so that they have more options. That was in my mind. We're always just trying to, to make it um, digestible for them almost. Um, they've got a lot to going on in their lives. They students are sharing laptops, sharing things. Um, and so I wanted to make it as functional as possible. Um, so my next question here is, why is water so special to life on Earth, not some other substance? This would normally be a whole 
unit on water special properties and intermolecular forces. So I chose to, uh, to tune into one thing that they'll need for biology next year, the hydrogen bonding, um, just so that we can, we can just get the fundamentals and then see how it applies to all aspects of their lives. So we can take a look at just maybe one of those um, student exemplars up there. Um, if you see, this is the work that they're turning in. These are just, you know, average run of the mill students. And I'm, I'm just shocked and blown away by what they've turned in. You know, I've got a PowerPoint slide with each task on a different slide. They're drawing things, they're putting them in there. Um, they went on a socially distant walk around their house to find examples of weathering and erosion. Um, and like I said here, feedback is another key. These weren't perfect, but that's their starting points. You know, there's a conversation, I would go back, I would tag things, I would comment and uh, ask my students to improve their work. Um, so going forward in the future, we go back to the slide. I am definitely looking forward to using these next year um, for exactly like this. I'm a scientist, I'm data driven. Um, and I give a weekly reflection survey to try and see where my students are at, how they're coming along, you know, whether they're feeling overwhelmed. I want to, I want to try and reach them as, as best I can. And this was one of the questions on there. Um, I asked whether my, um, choice boards were interesting and educational and I wouldn't get that response even in a normal classroom. So I'm already thinking next year, how can I use this to further engage my students? There's over 75% said, yeah. Um, and I did not pay a student to say that quote either promise. Um, so yeah, I just, I was kind of blown away by the effectiveness of this interdisciplinary approach and uh, looking forward to using it in the future. I'd just like to say that all the work you all have shown today is very impressive. And I love that every single one of you has mentioned how you're going to continue forward th with this when you return to the physical classroom. That's great. Hi, right, Suzanne, would you like to wrap us up? Yes. Um, so this is our final um, third three of three um, presentation um, around these great exemplars um, from the field. And we just appreciate all of these teachers being willing to share their, their wonderful work. And I think the three major takeaways um, that we're thinking about um, is how all in all of these cases, schools and teachers and teams have put students and families at the center of their instructional design, their curriculum design, and just the way they're designing NTIs they started experience of, and they started with the experience of students. They considered equity, they iterated quickly. Um, and also um, these teachers have shown great leadership and they were trusted to lead this work in their schools and they've definitely delivered for families in the community. So um, we just appreciate you all so much. Um, thank you. And we look forward to, to how this might look in the classroom in the coming year and um, all the ways that this work can be imagined and reimagined in other classrooms um, virtually and physically in our district. Yes, thank you everyone. I'm sure your students really appreciate uh, what you're doing for them, the parents as well. We enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed that session.